Hey, everybody who's joining us virtually will be kicking off in just one minute. Bring them out, bring them out, bring them out, bring them out. It's hard to yell when the barrel's in your mouth. Come on. Bring them out, bring them out. Hey. Bring them out, bring them out. Yeah. Bring them out, bring them out. Hey. All right, everybody. I get walk on music even when it's virtual. Welcome to the very first virtual Atlanta Startup Village. Uh, we are number 75 tonight. Sadly, I'm not looking at a giant audience, but I know that you guys are out there. We are picking up more and more people quickly on the live stream as we go. For those of you I, who I haven't seen since January, yes, I'm pregnant. I had a lot of people ask me this, so yeah, this is, this is what it looks like in live and in color. Okay, so bear with us tonight as we try out a virtual experience. First of all, this is only due to one, Atlanta Tech Village being such an amazing sponsor. They have been our forever sponsor. They are still hosting the space for us. Um, so if you have any interest in incubators, accelerators, startup hubs, or hot desks, this is the place to go. Second of all, this fantastic live stream is brought to you by PullSpark. Now, normally PullSpark is the guy in the back that I tell everybody to turn around and wave to. You can still do that. They just can't see you. Um, but in this case, PullSpark is also doing a ton of virtual events right from this very space. So if you're looking for somewhere to do them and somebody to help you make them live, this is the place to be and PullSpark is the team for you. All right, so doing a little more admin here. First of all, um, we announced this back in January and I wanna do a refresher because we haven't seen you guys in a while, but we are doing a competition. So at the end of the night, there will be audience voting. This is important because you wanna vote for your audience favorite and the winner then, and it was gonna be the end of the year, but now it'll be in another year, will actually go into a competition against each other for an Atlanta Tech Village hot desk and a parking space for a full year, which is I think like a $15,000 value, Hilton, is that right? She says it's hot for the money, so she would know. Um, so we'll have audience favorite vo voting at the end. Also q and I know that you guys miss me saying, please repeat the question and waving a sign at the presenters. Tonight we don't have that. Tonight what we do have is a live Q&A option that I will be reading off. So if you go to Slido, S-L-I-D-O dot com, and Hilton is going to put that in the live chat for me. It's also up on the slide behind me and enter the code ATLSV75 then you can put in your questions. So for the five minute Q&A, I will be in there curating those questions. You can also upvote the questions as they happen. So please be interactive. These are presenters coming up here and doing this in really weird circumstances. We're like staring at the five of us in this giant empty room. So anything interactive that you can do would be great tonight. So thank you so much. Um, also follow the, the conversation on Twitter at hashtag ATLSV. Okay, I think I've done all of the housekeeping. Normally I have a lot more, so this is weird, but normally I'd say let's give a round of applause. We can do that, like the seven of us here. All right, you can't hear it, but they are applauding. This is very exciting. Um, and our very first presenter of the night, IU2 Roadside. He says I said it correctly. Come on up, let's get you plugged in and started behind me here. Um, and as we're waiting to do that, Hilton's going to play us a little background music in between. There you go. And you'll just plug us into the HDMI and flip on your mic and you're ready. All right, all right, all right. Pack it up, pack it in. Thanks, Allie. Thanks for the intro. Um, welcome, everybody, Atlanta Tech Startup. 
under these circumstances, it actually makes it a little bit easier to present to you all. So really happy to be able to, uh, to do it real easy. So I'm going to go ahead and plug this in. You seen it on your side? Magic. OK, here we go. So I'm going to do uh, you guys a favor today. I'm going to teach you a little Italian, all right? So what you see here is aiuto. So I want to hear everybody, especially here in the studio, to say it with me. Aiuto. A little bit loud, aiuto, with the intonation, right? That means help. So two years ago, my wife needed help. She was eight months present, uh, pregnant, just like Allie is, right? And um, she didn't feel very good. In the middle of the night, I was um, out of state on a business trip. And she went to the store and picked up some Tums to feel a little bit better. But then in the parking lot, she ran over a nail. And she wasn't that far away from home, but it was incredibly stormy. And so she's freaking out because she spends 10, 20 minutes on the phone with Allstate. They're kind of giving her the run around. It's too late. We can't find a provider in the area. There's a lot of phone tag going on. And she calls me frantic. She says, Miles, and I'm in Boston at this, at this time in my hotel at the end of the day. She's like, Miles, I need help. And I was like, what can I do here? I got the kind of the download from her. And I'm like, there's got to be, there's got to be like an Uber for roadside assistance, right? instead of spending so much time talking with people and this and that and the other. And it creates a real dilemma. Traditional roadside assistance is as old as AAA started, 1904. They were literally delivering gas on horseback to broken down Model Ts, and nothing has changed. We learned about 10 years ago that Uber created an exceptional model as they kind of underwent a similar situation. Well, I present to you something incredible. Ayuto Roadside is peer-to-peer -peer roadside service. So if you need a jump start, a tire change, you get locked out of your car, you need a tow, shoot, you need a mobile oil change, we got you. Simply go on the app, request, just like you would with for like an Uber XL or an Uber Pool, and you'll get an SMS that the provider's on the way. Literally within about 15, 20 minutes, here locally in Atlanta especially, we'll get you a provider, you'll get back on the road. The whole point of this is to disrupt. We've taken about a year to, to create from concept to design to development to production. And now we're in about seven regions on the southeast. This is huge. So we're providing supplemental income for the gig economy. And tire changes put money in local individuals, local neighbors of yours' pockets. So this is huge for the local Atlanta market. It's available. And it's growing in many other markets as well. So now I want to take you through a quick little demo of requesting some help. Take out, got it, okay. Here we go, okay. So this is what it looks like. Ayuto comes on for Android and for iPhone. There's two apps, the provider app, you know, those that want to make actually supplemental earnings, and then the user app. So I'm going to go in the user app now. My developer uh, just enabled BioTouch or uh, you know, one finger, or I guess uh, touch integration so that you can do it a lot faster. And then you see the first item here is mobile oil change. Let's say I wanted to put in a schedule for that. So instead of going to like a really crowded, small, cramped waiting room, I can actually put in a request and have someone come to me when I need. Of course, as you see here, there's a mobile uh, tire change, jump start, fuel delivery, lockout towing, and tire replacement. If I had put in a request, essentially what it's going to look like for a provider and the user here, I'll kind of go through a live request. They'd see a screen like this. So instead of waiting on hold for 20, 30 minutes and not really knowing who you're going to talk to next, who you're going to get transferred to next, you actually see in real time that the provider, they have all your information right here to be able to accept or decline the opportunity. If I accepted on the user app side, you'd be able to see my face, my rating, an SOS, and cancel out of the, uh, the request if needed. So I'm really happy about this disruptor 
type of technology and uh, the ability that we have to, uh, to be able to bring this to the market. Am I going to go ahead and take questions up here? Okay, cool. All right. We have a couple of questions already. Thank you. I know Chang is moving his over. Um, how will this work if I was in the rural area without connection and needed assistance? Yeah, that's a good question. So essentially what happens is the AI, remember, IUTO is spelled A-I-U-T-O. We put the AI in auto, in roadside assistance. So if you're in a rural area, you're not going to get a service provider. You'll go through 60 seconds, and it'll immediately get routed to a live 24-hour dispatcher who's local in that region to manually basically make the calls and get someone out there to the rural area. How affordable is this for people compared to normal roadside assistance? Yeah. Well, it's kind of hard to quantify because normal roadside, you use it or lose it. Who wants to do that anymore, right? So this is on demand. It's per request. takes about... I think it's like 40, 50 bucks for a tire change. So that's like the medium cost. Um, I think comparably it would be about two to three times as much. In some cases a little bit cheaper depending on your plan. Have you considered partnering with Uber? <laughs> Uber legal team contacted us at the beginning of this year before COVID. And they flew me out to San Francisco. And because of COVID, I'm still looking for investors. How do you verify mechanics for their expertise? This is good. OK, so we actually meet in person. I meet at the gray lot across from uh, literally like Bobby Dodd Stadium right there that's decommissioned. And every single month, I meet people face to face. We have over 200 service providers. And in Atlanta, I know each one of them. I would send any of them to my family in the middle of the night in distress. What is your plan for community expansion? I mean. It's super easy to open up a city. I did one this morning. There was a, a per service provider out of Indonesia that wanted to start up. He had learned about us, so I opened up the city. It took me 15 minutes. What's your current revenue model and total market? Yeah. Well, I will say that we're profitable. We paid off all uh, debt to develop it and to design it and so forth. Um, however, the revenue model is obviously on demand, and we want to still take advantage of that and stay away from the yearly plans. You just got props on meeting each provider yourself, first of all. So good job. Yeah. What are the backups in case a peer mechanic or assistant is unable to help with the user's issue after arrival? I don't quite understand the question. So after, if there's an escalation, if you will, if there's a, a situation where they come and they can't help you, like for some reason maybe you're way off the road and their winch cable is like short or something like that, it gets escalated because we have a live dispatcher at every, um, every hour that's looking over and monitoring the progress of all the jobs. So she kind of has a bird's eye view of everything going on. I think you answered this earlier, but is this available 24-7? Roadside doesn't sleep. I mean, you get tire changes driving home from the airport. It's 3 a.m. You're screwed, right? You're on the phone. Like, that's not a situation you want to be in. So, yeah, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Are you planning to train crews to service EVs? How do you service EVs? I mean, we haven't really gotten too many requests. Um, but to not answer the question and to add a little bit of plug, we actually are creating an integration with Tesla so that you get in a situation and you're in a Tesla, when one touch and Ayuto is going to be able to, to help you out. That should be available by the end of this year. Well, kind of as a follow-up to that, have you considered using OBD2 port devices to streamline the vehicle diagnosis process? Trying to trip me up? I have no idea. You'll have to talk to my <laughs> developer. Send me that question in email um, or send it directly through our social media channels, and I'll be happy to give you a quick response. All right. We are at the end of time for Q&A. Apologies if we didn't get to everybody's question. We are now going to switch out presenters, so we could have our next presenter come up. That will be Spa Theory. Hey, guys in the room, can we do a round of applause for him?
Hello, everyone. I'm the co-founder of Spa Theory. My name is Alicia. I started my career in beauty as a spa receptionist. I observed that people were happier and much more confident after their service. I then became a freelance makeup artist and traveled to people's homes and hotels to provide my services. Busy moms, new moms, brides, to professionals. They all appreciated how helpful it was that they didn't have to travel to me, but rather I came to them. But serving one client at a time, there was only so much that I could do to create happiness and confidence on a grander scale. That was my aha moment. What if I could create a system that would allow everyone to book salon and spa services at a time and location that worked for them? The ultimate in convenience and quality. Spa theory was born. Our theory is, every person deserves the opportunity to experience their beauty, appreciate their body, and rejuvenate in pure comfort. Take a moment to care for the most important person in your life, you. Our virtue, our belief, our spa theory. Our vision is to be the world's largest provider of personal care services by delivering beauty and wellness wherever and whenever it's needed. The problems that we are currently addressing are busy lives, brides having to run around on their big day, driving back home after a relaxing massage, lack of privacy and availability, as well as the post-COVID fear of going back to public spas. The solution is we come to you at your time, your location. You can control your own safety and privacy. Apart from all the precautions that the CDC requires, we request the clients to provide their own bed sheets. We also recommend, if possible, to get the service done in an open area to increase airflow. We also don't take back-to-back -back appointments, some things that you cannot do at a public spa. We fit in your schedule. There is no waiting or driving time. Simply go to our website Select the service, time, and location, and we will be there to serve you. Our current target market is brides, busy professionals, travelers, athletes, and people in pain or recovering from injuries, as well as people who wish to avoid public places. Our competitors are other on-demand mobile services, as well as local salons and spas. Most on-demand services are limited to single service offerings. They don't have a live customer support. So how do I trust a stranger who's coming to my home? Also, contractors are paid unfairly. Your local salon can be of any help if you're traveling. And due to high overhead cost, they cannot pay their employees what they deserve. Spa Theory is a one-stop for all your salon and spa needs. Simply go to our website, and you don't need multiple apps and accounts to manage your services. You're just a call or a text away if you have any questions. We empower our professionals to be their own boss, while Spa Theory remains profitable with each service. We pay our beauty partners more than our competitors, including 100% of the tips that they make. On-demand therapists make more than those working at actual spas, which will play a significant role in supply-side recruiting. My co-founder is Chris. He resides in California. Based on his background, he has extensive experience in growth, operations, multi-channel marketing, brand positioning, fundraising, finance, and just about everything that goes into launching a successful startup. Our 12-month plan and ask is to raise our first 500K and launch across other U.S. cities, improve our technology to be faster and friendlier, as well as create a stronger network of professionals. The spa industry is the fastest growing U.S. wellness segment with over 100 billion in revenue expected by 2022. Also, the, spa, the day spa market where excluding hotels and resort spas, and where spa theory is targeting, is expected to grow over 40 billion in revenue by 2022. 
nothing works wonders in marketing than a happy customer. Thank you for listening to me, and if you have any questions, I'm ready for them. All right, guys, we are going to pick back up with questions again. Uh, again, put them over on the Slido channel if you can, please. Um, we've got a couple out here. Let's see. I don't know that I would consider this a question, but you've got lots of people who are saying that people tend to relax a lot more uh, when it's at their home, so they approve so far. All right, here we go. If I book a massage, how quickly can someone come to me? Two hours. Oh, fantastic. All right. How big is your market? Um, that's a question I'll have to get back on, but uh, the sales and the revenue are quite good. How are you different than other on-demand mobile services? So most services are limited to single service uh, offerings. So there is an app that just does on-demand massages. There is an app that just does hair and makeup. There is an app that just does nails. But we provide all salon and services. We are not trying to be everything to everybody, but how many accounts and passwords and apps do you really want on your phone? So this is like a one-stop for everything that you need. You mentioned expansion to other cities. Have you reached max saturation in Atlanta? What is the revenue and total services provided in Atlanta? Mm -hmm. So we launched February of this year, and due to COVID, we were shut down for two months. But we have had, in the last 20 days, we have had the same amount of sales that we had in the last six months. And we only have a handful of contractors at the moment, but we are expanding only with minimal marketing. So once we are stable here, we plan to expand to other cities when we are ready and we have some sort of funding. Okay, I think that actually answered a question of how big of a region do you currently service. Right. Um, Two people have now mentioned Style Seat uh, and specifically said that Style Seat also does some of these things. I would imagine Style Seat gives their customers the ability to offer in home appointments. How can you compete with that? So, Style Seat was initially just doing uh, bookings at your local spa. And due to COVID, they started doing in house just recently in the last two months. So, they are actually our indirect competitors, but they just started coming into our market, so they are fairly also as new as we are in the in-home market. Can you choose what specialist you can get, and can you recommend certain specialists to others? Is there a rating system? So currently, no, but eventually when we improve our technology, we definitely want to have your favorites on there. Right now, the company is so small that if, if you request for a particular employee or contractor to come to you, we can definitely honor that. So if your favorite is Melissa, Melissa will be there for all your services. Do you offer massages for professionals in an office environment? Yes, we do. How do you screen your contractors? So we do an extensive background check. I personally see them one-on-one -on -one in my office. Uh, we go through all the paperwork together. I list out my expectations, our core values, and I make sure that it's somebody I can trust to call at my place before hiring them. I also try out all of them before actually hiring them. So I get the service done personally to make sure that I like them. Is there a possibility of franchising the business? Uh, something that we can definitely talk about. Um, does this have prevention to corona is one of the questions. I'm not quite sure what they're asking. So CDC, again, requires all the salons to have certain precautions. We are doing all of that. But, you know, having the clients to provide their own bed sheet, you cannot take your own bed sheet to a spa. So that's, we are going an extra mile. If you have a private back porch or a rooftop, we request you do the service there so there is an increase in airflow. And also, we don't take back-to-back -back appointments. So if we know that a contractor just finished a massage, that person is not straight away going to another massage because we have to make sure that they have sanitized and they have a different, they have their bags checked and all of that. So we make sure of that before assigning them another client. I think you partially answered some of this, but how do you maintain and monitor employee safety when they're sent to a customer's home? Yes. So we do email verification, phone verification, anti-fraud, credit card details before. So we make sure that the customers, customers are equally safe for our professionals before our professional just ends up somewhere. 
do you have a reporting system in case a client has a complaint regarding their service or contractor? Yes, so we have a direct phone number uh, that was listed on the slide, and you can go on our website, you can call that number, and you will have a live person talking to you. All right, that is the end of our Q&A round for Spa Theory. Guys in my audience. Can we get our next presenter up on the stage, please. One moment, technical difficulties. No, not technical difficulties, memory difficulties. Uh, my name's Todd Williams and uh, I'm with ProsperCare. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our two year journey here with ProsperCare and start with a story about Carol. Um, Carol worked in a primary care physician's office that focused on seniors, Medicare uh, and Medicaid patients only, a really challenging demographic. And uh, we were there doing some content development for training for them and got uh, got a chance to, to meet Carol and have Carol tour us through the, the, the uh, in essence, the clinic. And she uh, was great with patients. She knew everybody coming out of rooms and just really engaging. And at the end of uh, our tour, uh, I asked Carol what she had done before she was in this role. She was an assistant front desk lead. Um, and this is a 60 uh, location, fairly large operation up and down the East Coast. And Carol had previously worked at a McDonald's in the drive through and, uh, and I asked how she got the job, and she told me that she had a regular customer, and the customer got to know her, she got to know them, and she took great care of them. And he asked, have you ever thought about a role in caring? And she said, I don't have any training, and thus her career was born. She'd been there four, four and a half years. And I asked her if she ever wanted to be a McDonald's store manager, and she said, no, it's just a job. She said she wanted to be a center director, and that light bulb went off. And in our world, uh, Prosper Care is really building the leading uh, platform for uh, uh, recruitment and workforce development for hourly care workers. These are people that are non-clinical, they're not typically recruited for, but they make up almost half of any role inside of a caring uh, community, facility, in, in spanning the spectrum of care, what we consider care being a, a variety of roles in care, from direct care to care support and care services. These are role types that then break down into specific jobs in what we term hospital to hospice, the entire spectrum of where you might receive care. And so the mission that we're on here after meeting Carol and in two years of, of discovery here is trying to solve around three key areas, the who, the why, and the how it happens in this market with these hourly workers. These are known as frontline workers, $15 an hour and sometimes less. And the, the who piece of this is really an undervalued and overlooked workforce. Um, these are folks that don't show up on LinkedIn. They're not easy to find. Um, our goal is to try and uplift and advance them and put them in a career path like Carol had found. The why is because our clients, we serve a client who is trying to recruit for these hourly roles, and it's, being, it's like been described as being on a hamster wheel. It's nonstop, it's constant, because turnover in this market is anywhere from 35 to 100%. And so they're constantly trying to refill roles, minimize overtime, et cetera. And the how we do it is we treat the candidate and that candidate experience like they're ice, and that ice is going to melt. These are people that live paycheck to paycheck, oftentimes single parent households, multiple jobs. And so our job is to speed them through the process and get them in and on board as quickly as possible. The reason is because this, this market space, as it is in size, I'll talk about in revenue in a second, but this market space is growing because 10,000 people turn 65 every day and will for 10 straight years. And what that relates to, as you can see in the chart behind me, is a single person living with life expectancy projected with between male and female uh, aging uh, seniors is going to add about 3,100 or, or 3,000 plus, almost 3,100 additional shifts in the life of that senior needing care 24-7. It's untenable with the number of folks in the workforce now 
And what you see in the current trends is the growing gap between the number of folks hired every month, which you see on the bottom, versus what's needed, which you see on the top of this chart, is the gap that's needed. And in essence, right now, there are about 1.2 million unfilled jobs in care. It's projected over the next five years to grow to almost double that. So we've got to grow the pie of the workforce. And the problem we're solving is this hamster wheel. Poor matches on one end in terms of candidates with hiring pressure on the other where there's the idea that we've constantly, the hiring manager is constantly doing this, but this recruitment of a non-clinical, meaning non-nurse, doctor, et cetera, is not a filled uh, a gap right now. That's the gap we're trying to fill. And the market size, there are about six to eight million people that work, that work in the uh, care market that um, in these hourly roles, roughly it's not an easy number, but if you take a roughly half, you can extrapolate it. It's gonna grow to about 10 to 12 million based on that need of those boomers all aging out by 2025. And the market size is estimated just for the increase in growth, not the current uh, number moving to, uh, to what, what it's gonna be, but just the gap is roughly a six to $12 billion market. The solution we've developed is really around key th three key things, it's recruitment, engagement and advancement, really helping that candidate move up the chain just like Carol did and out of that dead end single uh, hourly job into a career path. And the way it works is if, you, if Tatiana, in the case we're using here, applies for a role with one of our clients, she's moved through, in essence, a pre-qualification that allows us to screen for the best candidates on behalf of our client. And that then allows her to move through and set up an interview. She can look at the job, apply for the job, and be use, our client is using our tool to help funnel and speed that process up back to the melting ice analogy. It allows them to go everything through scheduling, picking a day and time that's based upon our client's calendar, and setting up the interview. That's a real tedious process for a client today is back and forth messaging to candidates. On the receiving end, especially with COVID, we now initiate video interviews. So in essence, that candidate, once they've signed up for that interview, is gonna be put in a video interview with someone, in this case, Helen, who's the hiring manager, and on the other end, Helen is seeing that candidate Tatiana show up, knowing uh, Tatiana's already been pre-qualified, so she can ask specific role, job role questions, et cetera, versus having to get to know the candidate. And she can also see other candidates that might be teed up at the same time. You are at the end of your time, unfortunately. All right. okay. So we must move into Q&A. All right. Again, please move us to over, questions over to Slido. Are you bringing yep. up your- Yeah, I'm gonna ask Neil to Bring up your to partner up? for Q&A, please. Thank you. It seems like you need a critical mass of employers and employees. How do you plan on complete competing with dominant players like Indeed? Uh, it's a good, good question. Indeed is just a job board. Um, uh, on this slide behind me here, Indeed does not present a candidate to a, a client. The client has to go and, uh, in essence, go through the list of candidates that show up as applications. That, that is a black hole in most cases. Candidates oftentimes never hear from clients because, or the hiring manager because there are too many applicants. So what we do is try to intercede and bring that candidate forward and elevate that candidate with their experience set and present them to the client. Is there a way for clients to rate and give reviews on workers like Yelp does for restaurants? It, uh, it is. The, the idea of kind of creating a five-star candidate workplace or marketplace is the, the model where candidates get rated and clients get rated where candidates work. So we can, it, it's two way in terms of it, the value it can add to, to the marketplace. It creates more transparency about great places to work and great candidates can get elevated. Okay, great. Waiting on a couple more questions. Y'all don't forget to go over to Slido or drop them into the YouTube sidebar for me. And I've, I've got a Neil up here with me, our CTO <laughs> to answer technical questions. All right, you heard the challenge, technical questions, guys. Engineers in the audience, put it out there. Who pays for this and how much? So uh, the client is the payer that's free to the candidate. The client, uh, from a revenue model standpoint, there's a fee for recruitment that we, it's, it's success-based. And then there's also a subscription base for us to engage through with training and engagement uh, to try and maintain retention with these candidates, which is another big issue, back to the turnover question. Um, our job is to both bring them in and keep them. As a physician, this solves a huge problem. Who do you sell to now? We sell to a, uh, at the corporate level, we sell to a corporate buyer who buys on behalf of multiple locations. So the idea is we, as an enterprise buy, we would be able to overlay our tool 
inside of any application process where candidates get pulled through, pre-qualified through our process, and then show back up for interview. And we're doing all the coordination that currently that physician is referencing. They have to do themselves. Do you also provide a platform for the hiring manager to interview the candidate? Uh, we do. And that's back to this, this platform right here. So they're looking at the candidate as they come through with the details in a profile that have been, we've served up to them, in essence, of updated interview or updated uh, resume, in essence. What software is being used to hold all the data? Ah, uh, software. See, you asked for a Database. technical question. Give yeah. it up. <laughs> in, in the, we are using Azure, yeah. our own platform. And then for the video, we're using Zoom. Do you integrate with hiring and HR platforms? Yes. Right now we integrate with ADP and the plan is to integrate with you know whatever is needed as we get more customers. What's the success rate as of now and how many candidates have been employed as of now? Ah, so we our primary uh, initial market is Los Angeles. We've got about 4,000 candidates in our network. Um, we pulled through and interviewed probably uh, pre-screened about 800 of them that have now moved all the way through to interview. We've probably placed 350 folks for interview and then there's a, it's in essence a funnel effect for the number of candidates you start with at the top that come out the bottom. But we've had probably 150 hires made over the course of you know the two years we've been doing this. Not really a question, but so Sam would like to say, who made your slide deck? It looks sick. <laughs> So uh, good job. Well, thanks. A doctor made it, and it, that's why it looks sick, because he knows how to make it well. So. <laughs> the doctor of slides. All right. We've got time for another question or two. Anyone else? All right. Fantastic. Round of applause, and let's get Clove up. up no ceiling when we in our zone. I got that sunshine in my pocket. Got that good soul in my feet. I feel that hot blood in my body when it drops. Ooh, I can't take my eyes off of it. Moving so phenomenally. Come on, rock the way we rock it. So don't stop. And under the lights, when everything goes, nowhere to hide when I'm getting you close. All right, our final two presenters of the night are for clothes. They are switching out. Don't forget to put your mics on, gentlemen. All right. Hello, everyone. We are Clove, and we are building solutions for modern customer service. What is modern customer service? Modern customer service looks like an organization that provides service that is easy, both for the customer and for uh, the service representative. It looks like service that is authentic in terms of the reaction or the interactions that they have between each other, and it is service that fosters relationship between the organization and the customer. What is the result of modern customer service? Modern customer service creates higher customer satisfaction, it creates higher uh, representative satisfaction, and it creates higher customer and representative retention customers for your organization, representatives within your organization. So who are we? We are. Hey everyone, I'm Steve Bussey. I'm a software architect and I love to build product. And I am Andy Perez and I have been building uh, support teams uh, within the uh, sales industry recently. So let's talk about the problem that we are currently solving for. Um, during the time when I was uh, leading a support team, the, uh, we would get tickets that every now and then someone would say, well, your app is running slowly. And then you'd see the support person who received that ticket kind of hang their head a little bit and think like, okay, well this is gonna be a journey for the two of us. And over time, they would ask the customer, well, okay, well can you get me this information? The customer would then go through some steps to get that information to them and then that information wouldn't be the information that they needed. And then they would look at the logs and the logs wouldn't be the information that they needed. And what would end up happening is it turns out that there is data that lives on the customer's computer or in the customer's network or local to the customer that you can't get through logs or through any other means. And so then you set up a screen share. And once you send the email to set that screen share up, then you wait for the customer to get back to you for when you can schedule the screen share. And then three days later, you get on the screen share and you hope that you're looking for the right thing. You gather the right data. Maybe you take it to an engineer. And then that engineer says, no, it turns out that's not 
what we need. And so now we need to schedule another screen share. And so weeks later, this is the kind of a customer experience that you're trying to avoid. So from Steve's perspective. Yeah, and then you know, you're, you're asking for something. You, you get it back. So as an engineer, you get this basically packet of info. And you say, ah, oh, I know that you did a screen share to get this, but I actually need more data. And then you end up getting another screen share. And then it maybe has to get escalated even further and need more data. So you end up taking a week or two weeks just data collecting to solve a problem. And here's what that looks like. This is one piece of data that we collect with our platform. And these are different uh, support articles across the industry that tell you how to get this data. And you'll notice some of these, uh, you might not be able to see in the screen, but there's big warnings on these. This data is sensitive. If you give someone this data, you're essentially giving away the keys to your account. And this is on major players in the tech industry. So we at Clove are building intelligent screen recording. Our goal is to build a solution that allows you to capture the screen of the customer that's having the problem, along with all of the data that's going to help you actually solve the problem, all in one package, all at one time, and all in an easy way for the customer. So our mission with this is to lower support cost through faster ticket resolutions. When you have more troubleshooting data and you have fewer calls and screen shares and easier information sharing, you're getting that benefit to your team internally. And you're getting higher customer retention. You're having happier customers. Of course, if you're a customer and you have less back and forth and you can just give one thing and your problem can be solved, that's a good experience. So let's go into a quick demo of this. Let me uh, watch the screen there. So as a support agent, you're going to have received a, a ticket or a chat, and you want to basically get information from this customer. So you just really easily generate a link for this customer, and you send it to them. When they click it, they're prompted to install our Chrome extension, which is going to tell them how to do this recording. Then they go to their website that's giving them a problem. They click our extension and hit record. Then they would do whatever they would be uh, doing to demonstrate the problem. And then when they're done, they end that recording and they upload it to Clove. And then the support agent can immediately see that and see all of the data that went with that. So in this case, I can see all of the different network requests and different information about them. And we strip out information that would be highly sensitive so that you can't get hacked or anything like that, which is a huge concern with this type of solution got all the console logs, got information about the customer's computer, the type of performance that they saw, the amount of memory your app is taking, what other type of extensions they have, because we all know that Chrome extensions can play not nicely with you. So that is our platform, and we are ready for any questions. All right, fantastic. What industry are you focusing on first? Business to business companies that uh, have products that you interact with through a browser. What is Clove's monetization model? Yeah, so we currently are doing uh, pricing based on the number of screen recordings that you're going to grab per day. But we're, since we're so early, we're looking at different ways of monetizing. But essentially, it's going to be subscription to the platform or subscription per recording. Do you have any customers yet? And what's the revenue model? We are building a. Um, uh, this is the, the app itself is in production. We're building a uh, product team of uh, particular users who uh, are from different companies that we know well that are really well suited for this particular type of product. And we're using them to uh, get feedback and information to us quickly so that we can do any kind of iteration and we can add any sort of features that they find useful for their particular type of support process. How can you be sure that you're filtering out all the privacy sensitive information? Yeah, I'll take this one. So the major things you have to be concerned about regarding privacy are cookies. Any cookie could be uh, highly sensitive information, and any post data. So what we do is we don't capture that data. We just, we just strip it out. So we don't capture any post data. We would tell you what the names of it are, but we wouldn't actually give you any of the values, which is where the sensitive information is. And then the same, same thing for cookies. So you can see that the user has a particular cookie, which can be useful for troubleshooting certain problems. But you're not actually going to be you're not going to be able to see the value of that cookie, which is where the sensitive information lies. I think you answered some of this earlier, but is this profitable and how much money are you looking to raise? 
I'll take this one. Yeah, I feel on. more passionate about this. I am, we, we're, we're a bootstrap company. Uh, I, I really like the, the model of bootstrapping and not taking VC. So right now we are, as Andy mentioned, working on building up that initial customer base. But our, we're not looking to raise any money. We're just going to bootstrap it and be profitable based on early customers. Yeah, of particular importance, um, we don't think that necessarily this particular product is going to um, be a giant rocket ship uh, to the moon. Instead, what we're focusing on is building, um, building a platform that includes things like this that go towards the things we talked about at the very beginning of this presentation. So when we're trying to do modern customer service, what we're trying to do is get technology that helps make those particular areas of customer service better so that the company becomes more profitable and the customers are e more easily retained and more loyal to the product. What's your technology stack and what's the backend database? Why? <laughs> I might know who asked this. Uh, if you can tell me after. Uh, so our, our stack is, a, we use Elixir for our backend uh, server, and we use React for our, to power our Chrome extension, and we're storing all of our data in Postgres on Google Cloud Platform. So we've got two questions that, again, have to do with privacy. Um, one is, I hear all the good things about the business, but how secure is your security? Because it holds a lot of personal information. And as a follow-up, how is the data stored and destroyed upon solution of the client's problem? Yep, so we automatically destroy any data after 90 days of the, of the problem resolution. And then obviously we can look at retention periods because there can be value in looking back at previous things, especially if they don't actually contain any sensitive information in them. And then, like I mentioned, all of our platform is based on Google Cloud. So we are going direct from client to cloud in terms of storing all of our files. So we actually don't even have any, any of our own servers in the middle there to store or interact with that sensitive data. The important part here is that there are companies that are very, very, very big um, and small, but there are ones that are very big that are currently requesting this type of data from their customers via support. And those, uh, those help files that we were showing on screen, those are from companies that are telling customers how to get a HAR file, um, which is one of the pieces of data that we pull, and the most sensitive one. How to get one and then to send it to support. Now the thing is, is that They'll provide all kinds of warnings and things like that. What we're, the way that we're combating that is that you have any of that data, any of the session info that's hackable, any of the things that, you, that are particularly private, gets deleted before it ever leaves the customer's computer, meaning it doesn't get compiled at all into anything that's sent to anyone, us or the company or anything else. So the data that can be pulled out that is sensitive is pulled out before anyone ever can see it, be that rep or anyone else. What makes you different from big name players like ConnectWise? Generally the question is what is the data that they pull versus what is the data that we pull? Ours in particular is different from a lot of those, a lot of the companies that are currently, that basically are pulling data as you are using the, uh, the as you're using their, your, uh, your organization's platform. What I mean by this is there are certain things that by nature of how browsers work if you have code within your product, that code does not have access to anything outside of its own environment. Whereas an extension has the access to all of that information via Chrome itself. So we use Chrome's API to be able to pull all that information, um, and that's how we get things like memory pressure, uh, CPU usage, um, things like the HAR file, and so on. Um, so the difference in particular is the data itself that we're getting. Awesome. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, guys in the audience, can I get a All right, so for those of you at home who haven't yet voted, please go online. It's at the same link as the Q&A, slido.com, ATLSV75. There's a poll. It says live poll, so we're going to give you all a second to vote. Which pitch would you select as your favorite tonight? Again, what's on the line is a whole year of hot desk at Atlanta Tech Village and free parking, which if you've ever driven in Buckhead, it's kind of a big deal. As we're waiting on that to go, a little bit of housekeeping. Again, if you are interested in presenting with me, am I, am I in the shot? All right, good. Sorry, technical difficulties, guys. If you're interested in presenting at Atlanta Startup Village, please reach out to me, Allie Merritt. Um, my information is on the Meetup page. It's also Allie in the ATL at gmail.com. Super simple. You can find me on Twitter as well, or you can reach out to ATLSV on Twitter, and we will get back with you. 
Keep voting, guys. We're at 55 people, and I know there were like 100 of y'all on the live stream, so I expect more because you guys got very interactive with the question. We're going to give it just one more minute. I'm going to cut it off in a minute. So if you're going to vote, vote now. Just so we've, oh, y'all, we're neck and neck. If you're going to vote, vote now. Now is the time. We've got two people, front runners, and they're at the same percentage. I'm going to cut it off at 752, so vote now. Now, normally, we also have uh, volunteers. We have beer sponsors. Hopefully, all of those things will be back soon. But in between, we are working on some ways to get some networking and get those of you in the audience back connecting with each other. So bear with us. We will be back in October. Um, we're doing every other month now. So please give us a hand. And uh, y'all, we're still neck and neck. Keep voting. <laughs> Right now, it's between Ayuto Roadside and Spa Theory, so get to it. Oh, Prosper Care is picking up another couple. Clove picked up another few. All right, I'm counting it down to 7.52, and then we're going to shut it down. And thank you all for joining us on the Q&A tonight and getting interactive. I have a clear winner. Tonight's winner of Atlanta Startup Village number 75 is a YouTube Roadside. Can we get some virtual clapping and clapping in the audience? You wanna come up and wave? I feel like you should come up and wave. I'm gonna go over here with my mask. Just come up and be like, hey you guys, thanks. Help 20. So download the uh, Ayuto Roadside app and put in promo help 20 for $50 Ayuto cash. Thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight. We appreciate you, and we are wrapped up. See you in October. Thank you.